chapter 13. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9. The title of this message is, It's Time to Go. It's time to go. You say, it's time to go where? Well, wherever it is God has called you to go. I, I believe that the time of sitting in a church pew is over. It's over. Many of you have been sitting in the church pew for years. It's time to go and do what God has called you to do. Did you know that there's not a gift of sitting in the church pew? Some of y'all think you got that gift well. I mean, y'all operating it every Sunday and been operating it for years. There's no such gift as let me come to church and sit in a chair. God has gifted you to use that gift for the glory of God and for the people of God, not just for you to sit on it or watch this, or for you to what I call prostitute your gift. You use your gift just to make you money. And it is time for you to stop. It's time for you to go wherever it is God has called you to go for him. Or oh, let's dive right in. We got a lot of material to cover. Look what it says there in verse 1. Now, in the church that was at Corinth, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of, of, of Cyrene, and Mannion, who had been brought up, uh, with Herod the Tetron and Saul. The first thing I want to bring to your attention is that this, this, is, this was the church that happened to be in the city of Antioch. A great work broke out there through Barnabas, and now that there's a church that was being started there. And with every church, what's at the foundation of every church is godly leadership. There must be godly leadership to anchor God's church. And here we see it here, the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. The prophets there, uh, they not only foretold the heart of God to the people of God, but they also sometimes foretold future events. Uh, we see this in Acts chapter uh, 11 in verse 28 with, with Agabus, how Agabus was a prophet and he foretold of a future famine that was going to take place in the days of Claudius Caesar. And it did happen in the years of 44, 45 AD. So here these prophets there, but not only were there prophets there to foretell the heart of God to the people of God, but they're also teachers. Oh, I, teachers were foundational in the early church and what is so needed today. I, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir with a church like this. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir because you're at a very fine teaching church, a church that teaches the word of God. But many of us who came from the communities that I grew up in, and I'm looking out there and I see some of you out here, you know that there was just a bunch of preaching. And I think that the church, Big C, the church has been preached to death. See, preaching is for the unbeliever and teaching is for the believer. When you're preaching the word of God, you're proclaiming the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for people to give their life to the Lord. So once they give their life to the Lord, then they need to be taught. So what's happening is that, that many of the churches I grew up in, they're just some preaching. And the preaching is very colorful. I mean, sometimes they'll walk the pews and, and they're preaching and they're loud. It's a lot of loud, a lot of noise and a lot of pizzazz. You don't know much of what he said once you leave, but it was just exciting. <laughs> Something to excite your emotions and you're there and you who is preaching. And let's say after that preaching, you give your life to the Lord. You come back the next week, and there's more preaching. There's more preaching. And you come back the third week, there's more preaching. There's more preaching. And what happens is you never go on to maturity, like Hebrews 6 says. There's never a maturity. And in many of the churches I came out of, many people are not walking with God. You know why? They've never been taught how. They just hear preaching when they come. And so you have 
in the church a lot of preaching, but you don't have teaching. And like I said, I'm preaching to the choir here because that's not the case here. It's not the case here. It's, 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 it's the case in a lot of churches back east where I'm from and really across the United States. Very few teach. It's very, it's very little teaching. So you had some prophets and some teachers in the early church. Now there's names given to them. We see some of the leaders here. Uh, also in verse 1, and there was Barnabas. Let's just look at these people. And see if you identify with one of them. Here it is. This is Barnabas. Now, we know Barnabas, we we know from uh, Acts 4 and verse 36, his real name was Joseph. But because every time you looked up, Barnabas was encouraging people. They said, no, you know, your name is, we're going to start calling you Barnabas. No, my my name is Joseph. No, but you Barnabas now. Because he always encouraged people whenever they were around him. He always encouraged them. Oh, let me ask you this. Are you a Barnabas on your job? What about in your home? Or are you a, a Debbie Downer? Or are you like a spiritual pig pen? You just kick up a lot of dust when you're around. You don't pig pen from the peanut? What? If you're under 30, Google, Google that. And- <laughs> And, and it's a real dirty kid that will pop up, you know. And you just kick up dust every time you're around. This, this wasn't the case with Barnabas. Everybody left encouraged when they left Barnabas. Let me ask you something, wives. Wives, are you, are you a Barnabas to your husband? Or, or are you always just complaining about him leaving, leaving the toilet seat up? When you got rollers, curlers, shampoo, hair products all over the, the, the place, it, the bathroom looked like your personal beauty salon, and you complain about a toilet seat left up. I mean, it kills me. And, and then, then you, you, you pull out the gentleman card. Well, if you're a gentleman, put the seat down. Hey, can I start a new move here? Because everybody wants to be, everybody wants equality today. Okay, let's, let's go with that equality. If I am a gentleman by pull, putting the toilet seat down, can you be a lady by putting it up? <laughs> That's just a thought. That's just a thought. Everybody wants equality here. That just makes sense to me. You know, I questioned it. This, this is why I had to get out, of the, get out of the Marine Corps when I did, because I questioned things. Then when things didn't make sense, I questioned it. I, we had to go, you know, we had to line up. When I was in the Marine Corps, we had to line up. And we had to go outside, and it's called police call. You had to go and pick up cigarette butts. And I, I, used, to, oh, I used to challenge that, because I said, I don't smoke. I said, how about gathering all of the smokers and have them go out and please call their own cigarette butts. That's a thought. And but 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 I was an e nothing and I couldn't say those things and that's why I had to get out. But but I challenge if something doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. If we are a gentleman by putting the seat up, why not be a lady? And when you leave, you put it down. Now everybody's happy. You know, it, 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 everybody would be happy if we just did it. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm just trying to help us. I'm just, I'm just trying to help us. So Barnabas was an encourager. He was a curve. And the next one is Simeon, who was called Niger. Now, Niger is Latin for black. It means that he was from Africa. Many scholars believe that this was the same Simeon that carried the cross of Jesus in Luke 23 and verse 26. Now, if the, and, and, and he had that encounter with, with, with Jesus. If this is the case, then look at the next guy, Lucius of Cyrene. Now, this, if Simeon is the same Simeon that had an encounter with Jesus, it meant that he went back home, found his boy Lucius, and told him about his encounter with Jesus, And he came to know the Lord, and now they're serving together in ministry. Let me tell you something. There are some people just like Lucius 
waiting on you to come back to the job tomorrow to tell them about your encounter with Jesus today. And you never know. They can give their life to the Lord and come here and serve with you in the children's ministry, the youth ministry, the parking lot, ushering or greeting because you told them about your encounter with Jesus today. There are many people like Lucius waiting on you on tomorrow. Then there is Mannion who had been brought up with Herod the Tetron. Now, Mannion, not much is known about him, but the, it's amazing that this phrase, Mannion, this phrase, who had been brought up with, that phrase is one Greek word, and that Greek word can be translated as foster brother. So you may be saying, well, so what? Mannion was a foster brother. Well, it said that he was brought up with Herod the Tetron. Uh, this is key here. Tetron is a word that just means one-fourth. When Herod the Great died, his kingdom was divided up into four parts. Each son took a fourth, which is where Tetron came from. So he was brought up in the home of Herod Agrippa. Now, we know that Herod the Great was a murderous, murderous guy. Herod Agrippa beheaded John the Baptist. Mannion was brought up in that wicked, vile, ungodly home. But look how God plucked him out. And maybe this describes your home. Maybe you grew up in a vile, ungodly home. And now look at you now. God plucked you out. And now he saved you. Why did he save you? Because he loves your family. And he wants you to go back to reach them. But what happens so often when we're the only one that gets saved out of our families then we go back to family reunions with a cocky, arrogant attitude, with our noses in the air. Look at these ungodly people. And, and, and then when someone come over and say, hey, good to see you. I haven't seen you in years. And they're smoking. And you're like, oh, please. God. Oh. These lungs have been sanctified. <laughs> How dare you defile them with that smoke? God never saved you for you to go back and be cocky and snooty and stuck up. And then you're at the family reunion at the picnic with your Bible open. You know, got your leg crawled. You know how you dangling that foot. And God never saved you for you to be like that. He saved you so you can go back and reach them. I'm looking at some of y'all's faces because that's what y'all do. <laughs> and you're trying to... Yes, that's you. Cocky, arrogant, you get around coworkers and the company party, and you're the same way, same way. God never saved us to be cocky and arrogant. He saved us so we can go back and reach these people. That's why he plucked us out, so we can reach them. So... <clears throat> So there was Mannion who had been brought up at Herod the Tetron and Saul. We know Saul will later be changed to Paul and he will be the great apostle Paul where one third of our New Testament was written by him. So notice verse two, it says, as they ministered to the Lord, stop right there. As they ministered to the Lord, notice that he, Luke the author didn't say they ministered for the Lord. Many of you say, oh, I want to give me something to do for the Lord. I heard Pastor Tony on Sunday, I want to do something for the Lord. No, 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 no. Ministry is always to the Lord. It's always to him. What we do is always for an audience of one, and that's him. You're doing it to him. Notice, notice this. Luke didn't say they ministered to the people. Didn't say that either. See, because if you minister to people, then you will be tempted at times to compromise to please people. And this is why Paul said in Galatians 1.10, he says, do I seek to please men or God? If I seek to please men, then I am a, I'm not a servant of Christ, is what he said. I'm not a servant. 
You're not a servant of Christ. You're a servant of the people. See, if I'm, if I'm ministering to people, then when certain people come in or I hear that someone came to church, then I'd be tempted to come. Oh, maybe I shouldn't say that because, oh. <sighs> Ministry is always to the Lord. And I'm ministering for an audience of one. I'm teaching right now for the Lord. And you guys happen to be eavesdropping on our conversation. <laughs> and then as you're eavesdropping on our conversation, you're going to be blessed by it as well. See, ministry is always, always to the Lord. So as they ministered to the Lord, watch this. Look at the conjunction and, and fasted. Stop right there. Fasting is denying the spiritual, or as you were, denying the physical so you can focus and concentrate on the spiritual. I hear you all the time saying, you, you, you got to get it right. Well, I'm fasting from social media. No, you're not fasting from social media. You're taking a break from social media. Fasting, don't miss this, fasting, I hope you're listening, fasting is always associated with food. Food. Last time I, I tell you, you can't eat social media. So you're taking a break from social media. You're not fasting. Let's, because, see, I know how you are. You always want to be, try to be spiritual, super, super duper spiritual. You're not fasting from social media. You're taking a break. Fasting is always, always associated with food. Always. There are different kind of fasts. I was talking to someone after first service. There are different kind of fasts. When, when you're going to fast and there is no drinking or no food, that fast is no more biblically than three days. No more. No more than that. If you're going to fast, God leads you on a fast longer than that, then that's somewhat of, a, of a, what we call a, Dan, a Daniel fast, where there's no meat, no sweets, desserts, and fooling around and that kind of stuff. And, and you know, and maybe I need to say that out here. Maybe you guys are just got a little bit more on the ball than we do back east. But I always got to remind our people, when, when, we, when we fast and we say there's no meat, don't say, you know, I fasted for 30 days. I didn't have any meat. And then there's a pause as if you put a comma there and said, well, but I had fish and chicken. <laughs> what do you think fish and chicken is? Vegetables? It's me. Oh. Where do we get this mindset from? Fish and chicken is not, it's not me. It, what is it, a fruit? I, I, so if you're going to fast more than three days, it's more of a Daniel kind, kind of fast. Notice as they ministered to the Lord and fasting, notice this is when the Holy Spirit said. Notice that. The question is, notice what it says. Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them. Now, the Holy Spirit said, now separate them. How did the Holy Spirit speak? Was it like, hey, hey, I know, I know I'm interrupting y'all praying, but I, I, I'm the Holy Spirit. Separate to me. No, the Holy Spirit spoke through the prophets in verse 1. That's how the Holy Spirit spoke. Notice what it says, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. I want to draw your attention to the word now. It's as if the Holy Spirit has placed an urgency there. Now. The time to go is now. When is it? When should we go? Now. When is it time? Now. Not yesterday. Now. It's as if the Spirit of God is saying there's an urgency here. So he said now is the time. I, I, when I was teaching this uh, to our church, I, I had to stop. And, and I said, Lord, I'm not. I'm not satisfied with that. I said, Lord, is there something else here? I said, because, Lord, I know our people. When they hear now, and the Holy Spirit said, now is the time to go. Now is the time. I said, Lord, I know our people. Our people, as soon as church is over, they're going to go to the U-Haul and say, Pastor Tony said, it's the Spirit of God said, now is the time. Now, we got to go now. The, the next day, people putting in their two weeks' notice on their job because the time is going now. It's now. And, and I said, Lord, I'm not satisfied. I said, I know these people, they're, gonna, they're not, they're not going to take this the right way. 
And it was right before service, the Spirit of God spoke to me to add this in my notes. And this is this. Notice that the urgency of the Spirit of God came after they fasted and prayed. And this is what's key. Don't you run and sell your house, put your, get a U-Haul truck, put in your two weeks notice, and you haven't spent one second fasting and praying. I am amazed at how many people call themselves Christians who make life-altering decisions all the time hasn't spent one second fasting and praying, not one minute fasting and praying. And you make these decisions and many of them blow up in your face and you wonder why. Because, see, I'm so glad I added that because many of you, matter of fact, I, I just heard a story at the first service. At the first service, a guy, a guy came up to one of, the, one of the leaders at the church and said, hey, did, did, did Pastor Tony get an a email or a note from my wife? How did he know what to say? How did he know that I was going to be here? And he, No doubt, he went to his wife and said, you told Pastor Tony to say those things because he had made the life-altering decision, putting his house up on the market, doing all this crazy stuff, ready to move. They're not using me there. Therefore, I'm going somewhere where I can be used of the Lord. And he hadn't spent one second fasting and praying. It stopped him in his tracks. And I'm stopping you too because there are some of you here. This week, you're about to make life-altering decisions. And then when you heard me say, now is the time, now is the time to go, you're like, oh, boy, your legs were wiggling. <laughs> you better take that sign down from in front of your house, remove your two weeks' notice, and stop fooling around because you haven't spent one second fasting and praying, and you know it. And I'm amazed. Many Christians, Christians, Make life altering, moving out of state. It's time to leave California. This state, I tell you, so wicked, as if the other 49 got it going on. <laughs> this whole place is wicked. So I tell people, you know, you gonna leave? It ain't the environment, because wherever you go, there you are. It ain't the environment. You leave California, you go to Texas, you go to Virginia. It doesn't matter where you go. It's wicked. You just have to get planted somewhere and deal with the wickedness and fight the wickedness. Oh, somebody needs to hear that, didn't you? I'm leaving California because they're making laws and things here that I just, I can't take it. They're making laws everywhere. We live in a wicked generation. By whom... The Bible said we shall shine as lights. That's what Philippians 2 said last time I checked. That's in my Bible. Y'all, do y'all have that in your Bibles out here in California? <laughs> oh, okay. I just thought it was a Virginia Bible. <laughs> no, uh-uh. So the Lord told them, separating to me Paul and Barnabas for the work I've called them. It says, then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Now, I want to, uh, let me go and read verse 5. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they also had John as their assistant. Now, the first thing I want to uh, point out in verse 4 is how the Holy Spirit was very instrumental in leading and guiding the apostles in the early church. And even though the church leaders in Antioch, they laid hands on Saul and Barnabas and sent them away in verse 3, it is obvious that the sending was by the Holy Spirit, according to the first part of verse 4. They went down to Seleucia, which was 16 miles away near the mouth of the Orontes River. And Seleucia served as the port of the city of Antioch. And once there, they took a boat to Cyprus, which was 60 miles off the Syrian coast. Now, the question is, why did they choose to first go to the city of Cyprus? Well, number one, we know that the Holy Spirit sent them there. We know that. Uh, number two, according to Acts 4.36, it was the hometown of Barnabas. <laughs> Don't miss this point. God works supernaturally in a natural way. Yes, God sent them to Cyprus, but they also, don't miss this, 
They wanted to go to Cyprus. It was both. Why am I in Virginia? Because God sent me there. I used to live out here. God sent me to Virginia. But you know why I'm in Virginia as well? Because I wanted to go. Simple as that. See, Philippians 2.13 says, it is God who works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. So God wanted me to go to Virginia. Then he put it in my heart to go. And I said, honey, told my wife, honey, we're going to Virginia. Isn't that simple? See, some of y'all, y'all, y'all so super spiritual. Y'all want, y'all want the voice from heaven, part the cloud. God said, hello, and he says your name. I need you to go to Virginia. That's what you want. God works supernaturally in a very natural way. I, I tell people all the time, you know, I'm talking to folks, and they say, you know what? I'm afraid to really commit my life to Jesus Christ. Why? Shh. He may send me to the jungles of Africa. And I look at him, you know, with my head tilted. I said, do you want to go to the jungles of Africa? No. I said, then God's not going to send you there. If God wanted you to go to the jungles of Africa, he'd put it in your heart to go there. You couldn't wait. You know, oh, boy, I can't wait. What you can't wait? Where, where you going? To the jungles of Africa. Woo-hoo! I can't wait to get there. See, it's God who works in us, both to will and to do his good pleasure. God wanted them to go to Cyprus, Saul and Barnabas. But Barnabas wanted to go there. It was his hometown. Isn't that simple? You see, how God works supernaturally in a very natural way. Y'all want the sparks and y'all want clouds parting and all this. And God, I'm just waiting on the Lord. I was talking to a guy on social media before, arguing over something dumb about going, share, spreading the gospel. He said, I'm just waiting to be led by the Lord to go. I said, he told us to go 2,000 years ago. <laughs> you want a personal invitation? Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Which part of go do you not understand? I said, you know, but out here, California, it's super spiritual. Oh, I'm we- waiting to be led of the Lord. all that playing around. That's your excuse to not go. That's what it is. That's your excuse uh, excuse to be a procrastinator. That's what it is. Yep. I came all the way to Virginia to tell you that. (laughs) I did. (laughs) The, The second thing I want to bring to your attention is we must first be a missionary at home before we ever try to be a missionary anywhere else. Uh, We see this in the qualifications of a pastor in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 5. It says, if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the house of God? It's a rhetorical question with an obvious negative answer, meaning that he can't. The man called to ministry must first be a minister at home before he ever tries to minister at church. But we see it here. Saul, or or should I say Barnabas, wanted to first learn how to be a missionary at home before he goes out and tries to be a missionary around the world. So if our homes are our churches, then how's your church doing, men? Single parents? If our homes, if our homes are our mission field, then how are you being a missionary at home? See, you don't want, men, you don't want your wives to despise your ministry because they come to church and see you greeting everybody. How are you? Good to see you. Till you're handing out a bulletin, opening up the door. And for her, she gets the door slammed in her face. You're a grump at home. 
but you're so bubbly and so everything here. Oh, ladies, you're no different. You don't want your husband to despise your ministry. You're serving here. Like yesterday, there, there were 430-some guys who bought breakfast burritos and things. That means there are some people who had to make those burritos. And you're here, and you, you're making burritos, and, oh, we, are we running out? Okay, all right. And you're rushing, you're running around here, and you're making, rolling them up, putting them in aluminum foil, and you know, cutting them in half, and you're just doing all. And the husband's looking back and saying, well, I, I just want to get a plate of food. Can I get a plate at home? I only have two hands. Where do you think I am? You get up and get it yourself. Nothing wrong with your legs. <laughs> but you get here. And you're all bubbly, oh, whatever you need, oh. <laughs> you must first learn how to be a minister at home. You must first learn how to be a missionary at church. You must first learn how to be a usher, a greeter, a parking lot person at home before you ever try to be one here because your family, they're watching. And if you're not that way at home, they're going to despise your ministry. They'll despise your ministry. And this is why Barnabas knew before he ever tried to be a missionary around the world, he had to first learn how to be a missionary in his own home city. So they arrived in Salamis, which was the main port city. And they wanted to reach the large Jewish population in that area, so they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, according to verse 5. They also had John as their assistant. Now, this is John Mark, the nephew of Barnabas, according to Colossians 4.10. For you note-takers, um, Colossians 4.10 says that Mark was the cousin of Barnabas. There's no Greek word for nephew, so the closest translation could be cousin, kind of, but it was his nephew. Now, we know from Acts 12, 12 that John Mark was from Jerusalem. And when Barnabas and Saul took financial relief to the church in Jerusalem during that famine, that Agabus prophesied would take place. When they came back to Antioch, John Mark wanted to go with his uncle. Hey, Uncle Barney, can I, can I go with you? Please take me with you. He said, okay, boy, come on, come on. And he brought John Mark back with him. And now John Mark is with them on the first missionary journey. Look at verses 6 through 8. <clears throat> now, when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Now, here's this missionary team heading out with joy and excitement, and they were so excited that verse 6 says, when they had gone through the whole island, they were so excited, they went through the whole island uh, to Paphos, which was the capital of Cyprus on the southwest coast. It, it was also known for being the center for the worship of Aphrodite, or the Roman name of Venus, which was the goddess of love. Uh, the greatest festival in Cyprus in honor of Aphrodite was called the Aphrodisia, which was held for three days in the spring that was attended by a great, great many people around Cyprus as well as other countries came to celebrate this festival. The women living there had to commit to being a temple prostitute at least once in her lifetime. Oh, it was a sad place, but a place very near and dear to the heart of Barnabas. Now, we look at this as being terrible. We say, you know what? How can those women commit to being a temple prostitute at least once in their lifetime as if that is some kind of badge of honor or something? But you know what? Barnabas, this was his hometown. He loved these people, and he wanted to reach them for Jesus Christ. How different is it here in our country? People giving themselves over to Aphrodite, the goddess of love, looking for love. How many of you here 
have gone through many relationships, ladies, many men looking for love. See, we can easily look down upon these people here, but our country is no different. There are people on the corners right now giving themselves over to Aphrodite. There are people more professional that are call girls and call boys. There are young ladies right now putting themselves through, through college, all in the name of strip clubs and all in the name of Aphrodite. And we easy can look down upon these people because when you see them on the corner, when you hear about them, when you see them on billboards as you're driving across the country and you see them advertising themselves or whatever, how do you feel about them? Does your heart break? Do you give them your anger more than you give them your prayers? It's a sad thing. Yes, it is sad. But how do you feel towards them? Do you look at them and with disdain and just, oh, can believe them. Our generation is no different than what they were doing here. They gave themselves to being temple prostitutes. There are many people who are giving themselves for free, all in the name of looking for love. And it's a sad thing. Yes, it is. But does your heart break for them? Or do you turn your nose and look down upon them? See, does your heart break for this generation? Does your heart break when you hear about all the people up on Skid Row up there in L.A.? Does your heart break for them? When you see folks around here, they're out of their minds. Does you, you're like, oh, get away from me. Or, or does your heart break for them? See, Barnabas' heart, it broke for his people in Cyprus. And that's why he wanted to go there and reach them. If your heart doesn't break for this generation, you will never reach them. You will never, you will stay in your nice little sterile incubator here. And when you go outside these doors, you'll pull your coat to yourself and, and, and run to your house and then you'll run back to the incubator and your heart never breaks for them. It never breaks for them. Your heart got to break. The only way your heart will break, you got to pray for this generation. That's how your heart breaks. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Is that your heart? The way you get the heart of Jesus is by drawing closer to Jesus. And then his heart will rub off on you. So this is what happened with Barnabas. This is what happened with Barnabas. I'm running out of time. I'm running out of time. All right. Now, whenever God wants to use us to further the gospel, Satan will always stir up opposition to stop it. Uh, I say this because when the team got to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now, the Greek word for sorcerer is magos or magi, and it does not always have a negative connotation. We know this from the magi who came from the east to see uh, Jesus when he was a toddler in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. However, Luke, the author, tells us how Bar-Jesus, whose name means son of salvation, uh, was being used by Satan because not only was he an evil magician, but he was also a false prophet and a Jew. So the Magi in this context does have a negative connotation or a negative meaning. And to show you the evil plans of Satan, Satan always wants to influence those in charge of rulings and those in charge of making decisions. He attaches himself to these people. We see it here. He attached himself to a Roman official. We're given his name. His name was Sergius Paulus, who happened to be the proconsul, which meant that he was possibly the governor of Cyprus according to verse 7. You know, I, I, I just, 
I believe Satan is still doing this. He is still attaching himself to those in charge of a nation, a state, or local level in making decisions and passing laws. Do not be overwhelmed when there are laws and things being made that are anti-godly, anti-biblical, and against Jesus Christ. Satan attaches himself to rulers and those who are in authority so he can influence them to make ungodly, unbiblical decisions. See, here's the thing. You're, you're, I, I've been keeping my ear out, my eyes out. It, many of you are freaking out over the, the governor and the different decisions being made, and you're freaking out and protesting and all that. Okay, you, you can do all that, but how often are you praying for? The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, that we need to pray for those. It says, I, it says first of all, that prayer, supplication, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority. Why? That you may lead a, a, a peaceable, quiet and peaceable life with all godliness and reverence. How often are you praying for? How often do you pray for the governor of California? Don't be shocked by the laws that they're trying to pass. And yes, we as Christians, we need to, because we're light, we need to go back. Oh, no, you ain't passing that law. That's great. But are you praying for him at the same time? Because Satan will always attach himself to those in charge of nations, states, and on a local level. But here's the thing, something else, we're given a further description of Sergius Paulus. He was also an intelligent man. He even realized that his intelligence or his knowledge could not satisfy his soul. His knowledge could satisfy his head, but knowledge could not satisfy his soul. And this is why it says at the end of verse 7 that this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God, even though he was possibly uh, conducting an investigation into this new religion, sweeping the area of Cyprus that he was the governor uh, of throughout the Jewish communities. But I think he had a genuine interest in the word of God. My point is do not write off the people like Sergius Paulus that are around, that are in places of authority, that are intelligent people, or maybe be, even be influenced by a bar Jesus. Do not immediately write them off that they would have no interest in the word of God or Christianity. This man had a position, he had intelligence, but he called for Barnabas and Saul to hear the word of God. Because your boss is your boss, because the company owner is the owner, because of all that stuff is going on, do not be shocked. They have an interest for the word of God. Like I got an interest for that phone to shut off. But that's another, that's another story. <laughs> Our church, no, they, their phone better not go off because I will just land blast them and put them on blast for the world to hear because when that message gets on the radio around the country, their phone will be talked about for the world to hear. Now, meanwhile, back at the ranch. These people, they have an interest in the things of God. You better believe they, they turn it off right now. They have an interest in the word of God and the things of God. But please understand, whenever you try to talk to anyone about the things of God, Satan will bring a bar Jesus to try to erase everything you're trying to tell them. Don't be shocked by that. This is a battle for souls. It's not an intellectual battle. I remember talking to, I felt bad for this poor girl. She was, she was a Mormon in our area and knocking on doors, and she happened to come to my door. Maybe she didn't get the memo that my house is one house you pass, and she didn't, and she didn't get that memo, so she came. And that poor girl, I'm felt, oh, I look back on it now. This was years ago, 10, 15 years ago, and I just blasted her out of the water. Every argument she had, I showed how Mormonism was false, that Joseph Smith false. I just blasted it out of the water. And then I said, now, can you go? to the next house and say that you have the true gospel. She looked at me and said, yes, I can. I said, this is not an intellectual battle. 
This is beyond intelligence. This is a spiritual battle for the souls of people. You, if you don't remember anything, you, you got to remember this. This is a spiritual battle, and you must talk to God about people before you talk to people about God. This is key here. This is so important because God will go before you and prepare that heart for you to share with them. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against, stop looking at the flesh and blood of your spouse. Stop looking at the flesh and blood of your coworker, the flesh and blood of your neighbor, or the flesh and blood of Sergius Paulus. Stop looking at the flesh and blood of the bar Jesus influencing them. The battle was not flesh and blood. It's Satan working behind it. Pray that God give you eyes of Jesus. Peter said, Far be it from you, Jesus, from going to the cross. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. For you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. He knew who was influencing Peter to say that to him. He knew it was Satan. Pray that God will give you eyes, eyes of Jesus. Let me, let me close on verse 9. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, this is where his name was officially changed, Filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. I don't have time to unpack that, but let me just say this. Saul was his Hebrew name, and it means requested one or ask for. And Paul means little. No longer did he want to identify with being the requested one. He says, call me little, because he understood something, what Proverbs 15.33 says, before honor, there's humility. James 4.10 says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. 1 Peter 5.6 says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due season. So if you're not being lifted up or exalted, two things are taking place. Number one, you have not humbled yourself yet. Or number two, it's not your season. Can I talk to you about that? It's not your season. So don't be jealous nor envious when it's someone else's season. Saying things like this, they don't appreciate me here at this job or this church. They do. It's just not your season. It's not your season yet. Some guy was about to, I told you earlier, about to leave and go out of the area. I'm going to go to this church over here because they don't appreciate me here. They do appreciate you here. It's just not your season yet. It's not your season. Somebody needs to hear that today. It's, it, it's not your season. Well, I'm going to go and get me more knowledge. And then they will see that I'm valued and valuable to this company. You, go, you can go get 15 doctorate degrees, and all it would do is puff your head up because knowledge puffs up and love edifies. It'll puff your head up, and it really won't be your season. It's just not your season. It's not your season. I've been at this company longer than they have. It's their season and not yours. So don't be jealous, envious, or angry when it's someone else's season. It's not until you see yourself as Paul. It's not until you see yourself as little. That's when God will exalt you and bring your season to you. You still see yourself as Saul, the requested one, the asked for. They asked me to come to this job. But it's not until you see yourself as Paul, as little. It's when God's going to exalt you. You remember what happened with King Saul in 1 Samuel? At the end, God said this. He says, Saul, King Saul, watch this. When you were little in your own eyes, I made you leader over my people. Implying you don't see yourself as little in your own eyes. You see yourself as big stuff. And that's why the kingdom is being stripped away. It's not until you see yourself as little, you see yourself as Paul. That's when your season will come. They asked me to come to this job. I'm the man here. Hey, listen up, everybody. I'm the... the kingdom of that position is about to be stripped from you. 
Because it's not until you see yourself as Paul. That's when God is going to exalt you. Let me close with this. It's time to go. It, it is time for me to go. It, it really is. I ran out of time. And we saw that it was time for Saul and Barnabas to go on their first missionary journey, but they first went home because we must first be a missionary at home before we go anywhere else. The second thing we saw was when God instructs us to go, Satan would try to oppose our efforts to get the gospel to people. So once again, pray and talk to God about people before you talk to people about God. And finally, Paul means little. Until you humble yourself and see yourself as being little, God will never do big things in and through you. So stay humble. The way you stay humble is through prayer. Every time someone had an encounter with God, they saw their own sinfulness. Stay in the presence of God. So spend considerable time in prayer today. Turn the TV off a little bit. Spend time in prayer. And watch and see how little you see yourself in light of how big of a God we serve. And when you see yourself as Paul, as being little, that's when God is going to exalt you. Not one second sooner. I got a lot of Saul's in here. You're the requested one, the man. And there's very little Paul's. And the Paul's in here, God is just exalting and blessing them. And you're sitting there stewing. Get in the presence of God. Repent of your pride. Them passing you over is to humble you. And you taking it personally. God is trying to humble you and say it's not your season. Somebody needs to hear that today. Get that for sale sign down. You know you ain't prayed, nor fasted. We definitely know you haven't fasted. <laughs> definitely. So may God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May you know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. And may you surrender yourself to the God who loves you so much he sent his son to die for you.